Thanks for joining us here at Chapel Hill. We exist to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have any questions or you'd like to learn more about us as a church, you can always check us out online simply by going to chapelhill.cc. We'd love for you to stay connected throughout your week and everywhere you go. Just go to the app store and search Chapel Hill, one word, to get our app. But now, let's join our worship experience for an encouraging word just for you. Our text is from Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. And I know you've been blessed by Pastor Daniel's ministry. And Pastor Bianca was here on a Sunday a few weeks ago. Pastor Jonathan kicked off the series. And so I'm just so, so thankful for these preachers, teachers. I hope you've also enjoyed the tasty treats on the way out. Some of them have been a little more sugary than maybe you, you had preferred. So today we're bringing you a healthy, tasty treat on your way out as we give you an apple. Now there is a little more than just us wanting to be healthy today. Uh, it really connects with the heart of this message and the title of this message as today I talk to you about the apple of his eye. If you have your Bibles right there, go to Zechariah. It's going to come up on the screen, and then we're going to go to Psalm quickly and Deuteronomy. But Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8 says this. For this is what the Lord Almighty says. After the glorious one has sent me against the nations that have plundered you, for whoever touches you touches, say this with me, the apple of his eye. Psalm 17, verse 8. Keep me, the psalmist said, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Deuteronomy 32, verse 9 and 10. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob or Israel, his allotted inheritance. In a desert land he found him. In a barren and howling waste he shielded him. He shielded Israel and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. I'm stirred about delivering this very, very important word for you today. And as many of you know, at Chapel Hill, we stand with Israel. In fact, we don't hide it. We have a banner on the parking lot, more than one, I think, that says, we stand with Israel. And we want you to know that. And it's a very important reason why we stand with Israel. By the way, I'm just coming in today and diving into the deep end. Is that okay? So we're just going to dive right in, and I just want you to open your heart. And I really appreciate that last worship song we sang, because I think as we start talking about these kind of things, that there are so many different viewpoints, and the, 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 the secular world, the politically correct world, has very different views regarding Israel. So I believe that we must say, Lord, I surrender to you and to your will, which that song just said, and I'm going to show you in God's word and in his will how he feels about Israel. He says that Israel is the apple of my eye, and I think how we should also submit ourselves to his word and to his will. Out of the Lord's goodness and his enduring love for Israel, God said in Deuteronomy 32 that I just read, I have shielded Israel, I have cared for Israel, and I've guarded Israel as the apple of my eye. And how many of you know God always keeps his word? In fact, recent events confirm this. In every battle and every conflict that Israel has faced since its independence in 1948, God has guarded Israel. Israel has fought eight recognized wars, including her miraculous victory in the Six-Day War in 1967, which, by the way, is 50 years ago, is the anniversary this year of the, the Six-Day War. Every single time and in every case when Israel was attacked, they've been victorious against impossible odds. And every time it was God who gave them supernatural victory against their enemies. Now, it's been said that the apple of a person's eye is the center. 
So I think God could also be saying, if you come against Israel and her people, it's as if you thrust your finger in the pupil of my eye. By the way, when you do that, you'll get his full attention. And as a result, the Bible shows us that God is ultimately going to give Israel victory and give victory over every enemy and every form of anti-Semitism in the earth today. During our break, and obviously this was stirred in me during our break, we attended for the sixth time the, the Christians United for Israel Summit in Washington, D.C. Kufi, as it's known, is only 12 years old, but it's already exceeded over 3.3 million members. Without a doubt, Israel needs a friend like Kufi in this day because the enemies of Israel today greatly outnumber its friends. And I share this with you, and you'll hear in just a few minutes why I'm sharing it particularly with you because there is a blessing that comes to you and to your family, I believe to your business, to your dog, and to your cat when you stand with Israel. Okay, maybe not the dog and cat, but I believe there's a blessing in your house when you stand with this. Now, I'm thrilled that when I arrived in D.C., I connected with some Chapel Hill College students that were also there for CUFI, and we were there at the D.C. Summit. We were at the Capitol, and, and we, were, we were visiting our senators, and we were visiting our congressmen, asking them to stand with Israel and to support pro-Israel legislation. Yes, these students and Cindy and I, and there's Dave down there on the far right, we were lobbying on Capitol Hill. Can you imagine my son-in-law, Dave Collum, lobbying on Capitol Hill? I'm just playing for those of you that know Dave. He's a fun guy. For instance, we encouraged our senators and congressmen to support legislation that would stop U.S. funding to the Palestinian Authority as long as they're making payments to people who murder Jews. That seems reasonable, doesn't it? Last year, the PA paid out over $315 million to families of imprisoned terrorists and the families of so-called martyrs who have died in murderous attempts on Jews. The United States still sends the Palestinian Authority over $300 million a year. Now, this should get, I think, the attention of every Bible-believing American. And I realize we do this for humanitarian purposes. But let's stop that until their behavior changes. It's like giving kids an allowance for misbehaving. Maybe I could best teach today by setting up the big problem. I, I've never heard it said more clearly or more concisely than when I heard Dennis Prager communicate what really is very simply the Middle East problem. It's, it's not as complex as many people would think. I want you to listen to Dennis Prager tell you about it. Take a look. When I did my graduate studies at the Middle East Institute at Columbia University's School of International Affairs, I took many courses on the question of the Middle East conflict. Semester after semester, we studied the Middle East conflict as if it was the most complex conflict in the world, when in fact, it is probably the easiest conflict in the world to explain. It may be the hardest to solve, but it is the easiest to explain. In a nutshell, it's this. One side wants the other side dead. Israel wants to exist as a Jewish state and to live in peace. Israel also recognizes the right of Palestinians to have their own state and to live in peace. The problem, however, is that most Palestinians and many other Muslims and Arabs do not recognize the right of the Jewish state of Israel to exist. This has been true since 1947, when the United Nations voted to divide the land called Palestine into a Jewish state and an Arab state. The Jews accepted the United Nations partition, but no Arab or any other Muslim country accepted it. When British rule ended on May 15, 1948, the armies of all the neighboring Arab states, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Transjordan, and Egypt, attacked the one-day-old state of Israel in order to destroy it. But to the world's surprise, the little Jewish state survived. Then it happened again. In 1967, the dictator of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser, announced his plan in his words to destroy Israel. He placed Egyptian troops on Israel's border, and armies of surrounding Arab countries were also mobilized to attack. However, Israel preemptively attacked Egypt and Syria. Israel did not attack Jordan and begged Jordan's king not to join the war, but he did. 
and only because of that did Israel take control of Jordanian land, specifically the West Bank of the Jordan River. Shortly after the war, the Arab states went to Khartoum, Sudan, and announced their famous three no's. No recognition, no peace, and no negotiations. What was Israel supposed to do? Well, one thing Israel did a little more than a decade later in 1978 was to give the entire Sinai Peninsula, an area of land bigger than Israel itself and with oil, back to Egypt because Egypt, under new leadership, signed a peace agreement with Israel. So Israel gave land for the promise of peace with Egypt, and it has always been willing to do the same thing with the Palestinians. All the Palestinians have ever had to do is recognize Israel as a Jewish state and promise to live in peace with it. But when Israel has proposed trading land for peace, as it did in 2000, when it agreed to give the Palestinians a sovereign state in more than 95% of the West Bank and all of Gaza, the Palestinian leadership rejected the offer and instead responded by sending waves of suicide terrorists into Israel. Meanwhile, Palestinian radio, television, and school curricula remain filled with glorification of terrorists, demonization of Jews, and the daily repeated message that Israel should cease to exist. So it's not hard to explain the Middle East dispute. One side wants the other dead. The motto of Hamas, the Palestinian rulers of Gaza, is, we love death as much as the Jews love life. There are 22 Arab states in the world, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Indian Ocean. There is one Jewish state in the world, and it is about the size of New Jersey. In fact, tiny El Salvador is larger than Israel. Finally, think about these two questions. If tomorrow Israel laid down its arms and announced, we will fight no more, what would happen? And if the Arab countries around Israel laid down their arms and announced, we will fight no more, what would happen? In the first case, there would be an immediate destruction of the state of Israel and mass murder of its Jewish population. In the second case, there would be peace the next day. As I said at the outset, it is a simple problem to describe. One side wants the other dead. And if it didn't, there would be peace. Please remember this. There has never been a state in the geographic area known as Palestine that was not Jewish. Israel is the third Jewish state to exist in that area. There was never an Arab state, never a Palestinian state, never a Muslim or any other state. That's the issue. Why can't the one Jewish state the size of El Salvador be allowed to exist? That is the Middle East problem. So let me attempt to try to answer this question. What does God say? What does God say about Israel? The Bible tells us that God made a covenant with Israel long ago, and a Bible covenant is not a promise that can be broken. Remember, now, we're talking out of Psalm 34, 8, O taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. And when you say you trust in him, you trust in his word, you trust in his promises, you trust in his covenants. All the way back to Genesis 13, verse 14 and 15. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are to the north and south, to the east and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. Forever. Somebody say forever. Genesis 17, 7 and 8. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you and I will be their God. I will give it to you, look what he said, as an everlasting possession possession. It's yours. You will be the owner. Everything begins with this. 
And if you believe God's word about his covenant with Israel, it helps you establish and maintain a biblical worldview about Israel and about what's happening today in the Middle East when there are so many other voices communicating differently. Covenant is eternal and unbreakable. Say that with me. Covenant is eternal and unbreakable. It cannot be amended by any person. It can't be amended by any nation. And it certainly cannot be amended by the United Nations. It cannot even be amended by Israel. According to Scripture in Joel chapter 3, verse 2, any nation that forces Israel to divide the land will one day come under the judgment of God. Again, what does the Bible say? Reading in the prophecy of Joel, Joel chapter 3 and verse 2, the Lord speaks of a future, a future event, future from now, a future event, Joel chapter 3, verse 2, he says, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will put them on trial for what they did to my inheritance, my people Israel, because they scattered my people among the nations and they divided up my land. Verse 16 and 17, the Lord, the Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel, blessings for God's people. He said, blessings for God's people. Then you will know that I, the Lord, your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. It's obviously very, very clear that God has made an eternal commitment regarding the land and regarding the people, and anyone who stands against them stands against God. There's a payday coming for Iran. There's a payday coming for Hamas. There's a payday coming for Hezbollah. There's a payday coming for radical Islamic extremists and radical Islamic Arabs who are attempting to destroy and murder Jews. God gave the people, the Jewish people, the land of Israel by divine covenant. And I explain this to you today because, because God is faithful. God is faithful to his eternal word. He's faithful to his eternal covenants, which means he's also faithful to the promise in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where he says, I will bless those who bless you. I will bless those who bless Israel. I will curse you, those who curse you, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Listen, you don't want to be on the wrong side of this. I teach this today because I want you on the Bible side of this. I want you on God's side of this because I know you're hearing different voices, different appeals. The the university campuses are not teaching the truth. God says, I will bless you for blessing Israel. I take this blessing of Genesis 12, 3 literally. I want my family blessed. I I want my children blessed. I want my grandchildren blessed. Cindy and I, we were were in Tulsa a few weeks ago visiting Brandon and Jarrah and the four grandkids. And uh, we had a meal that that, uh, one of the grandkids led out in prayer for the meal. And they prayed for the meal and they said, and and dear Lord Jesus, bless this food to our bodies and bless Israel and protect her borders in Jesus' name. Amen. And again, I'm just like, thank you, Lord, for my my kids not only get it, but my grandkids are getting it, and there's blessing on this house because they they are and they are blessing Israel. So how do you bless Israel? Just pray for Israel. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Psalm 122, 6. Pray that God would protect Israel's borders even as she is surrounded by her enemies. In just a few weeks, myself and others from Chapel Hill will be going to Israel again. And we'll be on that Syrian border at the Golan Heights, looking over into Syria. We'll be on the Israeli-Lebanon border, looking over and actually being able to visually see Hezbollah outpost. Lebanon has... 100,000 plus rockets pointed at Israel right now. Israel is surrounded by enemies. So it, 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 God says, I, I want you to stand with her. I want you to pray for her. I want you to pray protection over her. Cindy and I, we give through Christians United for Israel because we want to be blessed. Our church gives through Christians United for Israel because we want God's promise of blessing on our church. We're going to have a special Christmas offering. And in part of that Christmas offering here at Chapel Hill is going to go for a very critical project in Israel because God says, I'll bless those who bless Israel. Now, I want to define for a moment Christian Zionism. What is Zionism? Well, Zionism is a belief in the Jewish people's right, follow me, a belief in the Jewish people's right to return to their homeland and the resumption of Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel. 
A Christian Zionist is simply defined as a Christian who supports the Jewish people's right to return to their homeland. Now, the scripture is full of verses that foretell the restoration of the Jews and their return to their homeland. And by the way, this scripture has been and is being fulfilled as we speak. Amos chapter 9 verse 15 says, I will also plant them plant the Jewish people on their land and they will not again be rooted out from their land which I have given them, says the Lord your God. This prophecy was fulfilled in 1948 as the Jews were once again planted in their land and since then Jews have returned and returned and returned and over 6 million Jews live in the land and live in the state of Israel today. Yet Yet because of the prophecy of God being fulfilled in our modern day and being filled actually before our very eyes, because of the prophecy being fulfilled, Israel is viewed by many people as occupiers of the land and not owners or not biblical owners of the land. Or they are viewed as oppressors of Palestinians and they are hated by millions or should I say billions of people around the world but they were also hated before 1948 because they've always been the apple of God's eye. And oh, let me remind you that true Bible-believing Christians, you and I are not real popular around the world today either. Why? Because we've been grafted in. I'm going to show you in a moment. We've been grafted in and we true are the apple of God's eye. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Now let's go a little bit deeper and let me really speak to you for a moment. From my heart. Now, many people, even sincere, well intentioned, and loving people, use words like justice, use words like compassion to take a position against Israel. Even when Israel's enemy has one agenda, they want to annihilate the Jews. And the argument of justice and compassion always, always sounds very appealing. But let me give you a loving caution. There is a common idea among many people in Jewish Christian dialogue. And this idea will win the day. It will win the argument whenever people place their own authority above the authority of the Bible. The new authority today seems to express that if an, if an idea can be made to sound tolerant or it promotes this, an idea of justice or it's made to sound compassionate, then that idea must be good to endorse. Let me caution you. Notice I didn't say that idea is true, but I said if an idea can be made to sound, be, to sound tolerant or it can be made to sound respectful of differences and it promotes justice or it seems like it promotes justice or it seems compassionate, then that idea seems good to endorse. And that, ladies and gentlemen, really defines the concept of political correctness. But here's the deal. Truth is emphatically not a politically correct concept. And we need to hear that and we need to let that sink down deep. The reality is that biblical truth, Bible truth, can feel intolerant. And it, it can feel undemocratic. Because it is. It's a kingdom we're talking about. It's not a democracy. It's the kingdom of God is not a democracy. It, 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 can feel, it can feel uncompassionate. Truth can feel uncompassionate because biblical truth is not grounded in what you and I think and what you and I feel, but it is grounded in who God is and what he alone says. That's what it's grounded in. And we, we've, we've got to grab a hold of this. And by the way, truth says God is holy. He's set apart. He's he's not like you. He's not like me. He's holy. He's set apart. Truth says God is loving and merciful and compassionate in all of his ways. Are you? No, and neither am I. But God is. And if we think we're more compassionate than God, we've really got our thinking wrong. God is loving. He is compassionate. He is just. He is not an unjust God. He is a just God. And so blessed is the man who trusts in the truth that God is a holy and a loving and a compassionate and a just God. So I trust that. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. 
But the concept of truth is ruled out by many people because the truth of the Bible, stay with me here, the truth of the Bible can make people sometimes feel put down who don't believe it or who don't agree with it. And the first commandment of political correctness, of course, is thou shalt not make anyone feel put down. Right? You can't, put a man, keep, you can't keep a man out of a woman's restroom at Target because if you do, he might feel put down. At least that's what Target executives feel or think. And that same idea trickles down even, even into our daily life, even into Little League. Everybody gets a trophy because we don't want any of our kids to experience loss or ever possibly feel put down. I know this is sensitive. And for many, the issue of truth will not even be raised because the issue is just, how does this make people feel? So in regard to Israel, and in regard to the Jewish people's biblical right to their ancestral homeland and the unique connection that Christians have had with Jews for over 2,000 years, we have to choose whether we will submit to the political correctness and the anti-Semitism that increasingly rules our society, especially on our college and university campuses, or whether we will submit to biblical authority and recognize that God said, I give this land to Israel and it will not be taken away from them. I plant them in their land and it will not be divided. The Bible says the apple of God's eye is Israel. When you see an apple, I want you to think one thing. The apple of God's eye is Israel. In a moment, I'm going to show you it can be you too. The apple of God's eye is Israel. When we look through scripture, we realize that as followers of Jesus, we truly owe a debt of gratitude to the Jewish people. Why? For their contributions, which actually gave birth to our Christian faith. Consider what the Jewish people have given to Christianity. The scriptures, the apostles, the, 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 the prophets, the patriarchs, the disciples, of course, Mary and Joseph and our Lord Jesus, all Jewish. No wonder God said, I will bless those who bless Israel. As I mentioned, on October 30th, Cindy and I will lead another pilgrimage to Israel. And I know that the people that are with us, being in the land with their feet on the sand and being with the Jewish people, we will all see Israel in a new way. And most importantly, I hope we will all see it from a Bible perspective. I want to tell you, we send in our final registration this week. In fact, I think the window door closes tomorrow, the next day. So if you're interested still, you're on the fence and you want it thinking about going, come on and go. I'm trying to push you off the fence and come with us. But let us know tomorrow. Call us. Go by the guest services today and give them your name. We'll call you. But we hope, we hope you'll come with us. I know some of you probably could do that. We'll take a boat across the Sea of Galilee. We'll, we'll have baptisms in the Jordan River. We'll visit David's tomb. We'll go through Hezekiah's tunnel. We'll go to the Mount of Olives. And always the highlight is visiting the garden tomb. We'll share devotions in these places. Before I close today, I want to talk to you about our salvation and how all this fits, how God's plan, how sovereignly his plan has worked out our salvation in this great picture. And did you know that Jesus said in John 4, he said that salvation is from the Jews? Now let's look at Ephesians for just a moment. I want to spend the last few minutes walking through a few verses in Ephesians chapter 2 as it describes what condition as Gentiles we were in before Jesus the Messiah came. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12, look what it says. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope. Somebody say without hope. Without hope and without God in the world. That's where your salvation story starts. That's where my salvation story starts. We were a people without hope. Every Gentile, their salvation starts at a place called no hope. No hope. Every Gentile, are, Gentiles are non-Jews. Jews and Gentiles. Our story starts without hope. But then Jesus comes. And all that changes. Jesus comes. In verse 13 of Ephesians 2, it says, But now, 
In Christ Jesus, you who once were who were without hope or you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 19, jump down a few verses. It says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. So what is happening here? Paul's teaching us that once, once we were without hope, once we were separated from Christ, but now Christ has drawn near to us through his own blood. Once we were excluded from the household of God's people, but but now we are fellow citizens. Once we were, yes, without hope, but now we are fellow heirs of all God has to give us. And the whole picture here is not that we move into these spiritual blessings on separate parallel tracks apart from Israel, that we have this Israel Jewish track that gets to God, and then we've got this Gentile track that gets to God, but that we move to God together on one track through one Savior and one cross and one body and one new man and one spirit to the Father. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14, let's keep reading. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace who has made the two groups one. And has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Jesus didn't come to make a second alternative way to God. He came to make Jew and Gentile one. One. How? Well, keep reading. The Bible says in verse 15, By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new man, one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. What I'm saying and what the Bible is saying, there are not two saving covenants. There are not two saved people because there are not two ways of salvation. You know it. You can say it with me. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Our Christianity is through Jesus Christ, and our salvation is of the Jews. There's a reason it's called Judeo-Christianity. Thank God for the patriarchs and the prophets. Thank God for the moral law that we get from the Jews. Yes, God gave it to them. Thank God for our Jewish Savior, Jesus. The body of Christ, listen, as I close, the body of Christ cannot and should never stand opposed to Israel. We have been grafted into the vine. Romans chapter 11 verse 17. But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel have been broken off through unbelief. And you Gentiles who were branches from a wild olive tree have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing. Here we go. You also, you Gentiles, also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children. Doing what? Sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. That's the New Living Translation. What a clear picture of the spiritual benefit that we receive by being grafted into the vine through Jesus Christ. And so, if Israel is the apple of God's eye, then those who have been grafted in are the apple of his eye and that's you and that's me and so we stand with Israel and we pray with Israel and we pray for the salvation of Israel yes we say that we pray for our friends and our families and those those people in America we pray for revival in America but we should also pray for revival in Israel that Israel would be saved Paul says in Romans 10 1 our hearts desire our prayer to God is that Israel be saved My desire is that you put your faith and that you put your trust in Jesus Christ and that you are saved and that every one of you can say, oh, taste and see, the Lord is so good because I've put my faith and my trust in him and I've now experienced blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Listen, trust in the Lord is not just based on those things that you think feel good and that you agree with. Trust in the Lord is saying, "I've, I've taken the whole thing. I've taken the whole thing. I've I've bitten into that. I've accepted that God's word is truth from Genesis to maps or to Revelation. Maps is not a book. It's just all the maps at the end of the Bible. But those those, those are fallible. Those are not infallible. But Genesis to Revelation, it is true. It is infallible. My desire is you put your faith and trust in Jesus because I accept the truth of the gospel. 
And because of that, I can be grafted in. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever, Jew, Gentile, would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting, eternal life. So what do we now have when we put our faith in Jesus and believe that for ourselves? We have hope. Our hope comes from God. Our hope comes from his word. So with your heads bowed for just a moment and your eyes closed as we take a few moments and we just open our hearts again wide open before God, just as we sang in worship, Lord, I surrender. Could we just let that be our prayer right now? God, I surrender. Holy Spirit, I surrender in this moment to you. I surrender and I ask you to speak. I ask you and allow you to convict my heart. And I ask you to lead me into truth today. And the truth that has been shared, let that, let that discern the thoughts and intents of my heart. And help my heart to turn to you and, and help me to trust you fully. Maybe you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior, to be your Lord. But today you want to. The Holy Spirit is convicting your heart. He's dealing with your heart that it's time for you to be grafted in the vine. It's time for you to have an eternal hope. It's time for you to enjoy the blessings that come with knowing God through Jesus Christ. It's time for you to experience that spiritual nourishment. Oh, that's so, so good and so rich. But more importantly than that even, it's time for you to be forgiven from your sin and be released from the guilt and condemnation you feel today. Maybe you've never done that before or maybe you did at one time, but you've turned and you've walked away and you've gone your own way, living life for yourself rather than living life with God. On the count of three, I just want to know who would say, Pastor, that's me, and I want to be included in this prayer, and I want to, I'm, the Holy Spirit's dealing with my heart. I want to be the apple of his eye. I want to be grafted in. I want to be walking with Jesus. I want to be in a right place with God today. Would you just let me know by slipping up your hand as we pray? One, two, three. All over this room. Yes, hands are going up. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, hands are going up all over the room from the front to the back. Yes, keep them coming. Who else needs to lift up your hand? It's time for you to make a faith decision. It's time for you to cross the line of faith. It's time for you to say yes to Jesus. Yes, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. I want you. I surrender to you. You can put your hands down. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm just going to ask you, everyone in this room, let's just all join in. Let's let God do a work in all of our hearts today. Do a fresh work in my heart today, Jesus. I express my faith in you. And if you've lifted your hand, I'm going to ask you to begin to pray. I can't pray for you, but I'm going to guide you. And the first thing that I want you to do is just begin to say, God, thank you for hearing my prayer today. Thank you for dealing with my heart. And I admit that I've sinned. I admit that I've offended you. I know that I've broken your laws. And I ask you to forgive me. And I thank you that you died on the cross and your blood was shed so that my sins could be washed away. Not just covered, but washed away. Oh, he washes away our sin. And he's doing that right now. If you'll just ask him to, Jesus, wash away my sin. Maybe you've lied. Maybe you've stolen. Maybe you've cheated. Maybe you've committed adultery. Maybe you've lived as a drunkard. Maybe you, have, maybe you know the, the, there are things the Holy Spirit is showing you that you, you've not honored God. You've sinned. Confess that to him right now. Wash me, cleanse me, make me brand new on the inside, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for the new start you're giving me right now. I repent, tell him that. I repent. I'm going to turn and follow you, Lord Jesus, today. Maybe some of you just, you backslid. You just slid away from a walk with God. And today you're renewing your commitment to Jesus. Say, so Jesus, I renew my commitment to you. I call upon you as my Lord and Savior. And I commit to follow you and to surrender my life to you. And Romans 10 verse 13 says, Whoever, Jew or Gentile, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you for giving us a brand new start. Thank you for changing us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's praise him for salvation today. Let's praise him. Praise God for salvation. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
And Lord, help all of us to trust you in a new way and trust your word. Blessed is the man who trusts in you. Help us to trust you. If you prayed that with us today, and, and maybe you're new to Chapel Hill, or maybe you're not, but you've just, you just made that faith decision, I'm, I'd like for you to take that Connect card right there in front of you and, and put your name on it, but just check mark that box. I committed my life to Christ. I made a new commitment to Jesus today. Let us know so we can walk with you and encourage you and pray for you. I hope you'll do that. Now, let me give you four practical things you can do regarding Israel from this point forward. And I hope that you'll take these practical things and apply them. The first one is this. It's coming up on the screen. We can arise and take a stand for truth. We can arise and take a stand for truth. How many of you have ever heard the term activist? Sometimes you think of activists in a a negative way. Well, an activist is just somebody that's active about what they believe in. I think all Christians should be active for the things of God, don't you? And I think that we should take stand for truth. And in Psalm 102, 13, it says, you will arise and have compassion on Zion. It is time to show favor to her for the appointed time has come. That's what we were doing on Capitol Hill a couple weeks ago. We were just being active for the cause of Israel and Zion. Another thing that you can do is this. We can pray for the peace of Jerusalem. This was very simple. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 122.6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. So pray in your home, in your quiet time. Put it on your your prayer journal and pray consistently for the peace of Jerusalem. The third thing you can do is this. Take a look. Ladies, all the ladies in the room, wow, you can join the weekly Daughters for Zion prayer call. Say, well, how do I do that? Well, go to the Chapel Hill app and scroll down on there and look for Daughters for Zion and it will give you concise and clear directions on how to connect to that call. It's every Friday morning at 6 a.m. for 15 minutes. Now, I know it just knocked a few of you out because I said 6 a.m. But some of you say, you know what, that is a good time. I can do that. It's only 15 minutes long, and you can check in even a few minutes after and check out a few minutes early if you need to, but it's only 15 minutes. Ladies at Chapel Hill are praying for Israel every Friday morning. My sister lives in Arkansas, and she joins that call every Friday morning. By the way, it's 5 a.m. in Arkansas. But she gets up and does it because she wants to stand with Israel in that way. And finally this, all of us can go to kufi.org and we can sign in and say, I'm going to stand with Israel. Sign the Israel Pledge. Read the Israel Pledge. Then sign the Israel Pledge. Just put your email in. That's one organization I would encourage you to give them your email address so you can get regular updates and information about Israel. Well, I hope this has helped you. How many of you have learned something today? Well, I hope you have. And I want you to continue to grow in this because we know that there's a lot of opposition coming at us, coming at Israel, and for those who stand with Israel in a biblical way. Now, in just a minute, we're going to conclude, and I want all of those of you who might be able to help us by by helping support the Dunwoody location to meet me in room 120 right across the hall in just a moment. So we hope you'll do that on your way out in just five minutes. It won't take long. And for the rest of you, I hope you have a very, very blessed day and week. I want you to stand. Our prayer partners are coming, and they're going to come and be ready to pray for anybody who would like special prayer. We believe in miracles. We'd like to pray with you for all of our guests. We'd like for you to stop by the hospitality room right through those double doors. We have a special gift for you, so stop by there. But if you'd like prayer, you'd like someone just to pray with you and agree with you for miracles, whatever you're asking God to do, these prayer partners would love to do that. If you prayed to say yes to Jesus today, come and tell one of these prayer leaders. God bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Have a good rest of the day and a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. It's going to be amazing. Wednesday night, prayer service. As a church, it's our honor to play a small part in how God is working through this ministry to make a difference in your life. And we'd love to continue with you on that journey. To find out what your next steps could be in your relationship with Christ, all you have to do is go to chapelhill.cc forward slash next steps.